Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this virtual event hosted by the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. My name is Michael Van Beek, and I'm the Director of Research at the Mackinac Center. We're really pleased that you're with us today, uh, and we're excited for the uh, topic about uh, whether or not uh, the COVID-19 uh, lockdown policies are effective uh, or not. And particularly, we're going to look at uh, ways to think about and to study this kind of policy, uh, these kinds of policies, and uh, from an economist perspective, uh, how to tackle that that question. Uh, before we get going, though, uh, I want to turn it over to Joe Lehman, who is the president of the Mackinac Center, and he's going to provide an update on a variety of activities that are going on right now with the organization. Take it away, Joe. Joe, we have a really strong registration. Uh, numbers of, of uh, registrants uh, because this is a, a very uh, a key, it's a topic people are keenly interested in, especially for people in Michigan who traveled just about anywhere else in the country. They can see the contrast firsthand how the lockdowns differ from place to place. And I'm actually broadcasting this morning uh, from Florida on Mackinac Center Business. And uh, perhaps uh, there is no greater contrast between two states in the country right now than, than Michigan and, and Florida. Your help uh, has delivered some wins across, um, across the country and in Michigan. Governor Holcomb of Indiana uh, just signed a Mackinac Center idea into law. And as you know, we're a Michigan-focused think tank. But our ideas do travel beyond Michigan's borders, and we have been putting some effort into making sure that our labor policy ideas get special help from the Mackinac Center wherever people are willing to put them in place. This particular idea follows success in Alaska and Texas, where the government of Indiana is now saying that Unionized workers or workers in a unionized government workplace will not just automatically assume to be part of a union and then have to opt out of the union if they don't want to be in the union anymore. Uh, the assumption has now been flipped, that the presumption will now be that workers are not in a union unless they opt in with, uh, and the union has to present recent evidence and that recent evidence of a worker opting in is really important because it was only two and a half years ago that the U.S. Supreme Court said in its Janus decision uh, that workers uh, in government unions just uh, they, they don't have to support anything that the union does. And so it's a, it's a right that the court finally recognized. Not all workers knew they had that right. So now the governor, uh, government of Indiana, is saying, show us recent proof, and then we'll start deducting uh, union dues. So uh, I believe that Indiana is uh, the third of what will be a long string of states to take this Mackinac Center idea. So thanks for your help and support uh, in making that possible. I'm uh, still so happy about the Mackinac Center's new Freedom Embassy in Lansing that I've been talking about it on every one of these shows that we've done recently, and we now occupy uh, two floors of a uh, high-rise building in downtown Lansing, right across the street from the Capitol. Uh, it seems like every interest group you can think of has its own embassy in Lansing, uh, but now you do. Now you have an embassy in Lansing, uh, taxpayers and freedom lovers, and it's housed by uh, the Mackinac Center's government affairs team and some of our other uh, organizational friends uh, around the state. Uh, that we work with quite a lot, uh, groups like Americans for Prosperity Michigan, Great Lakes Education Project, the Freedom Fund, Michigan Rising Action, and uh, uh, the uh, Michigan Association of Public School Academies. So uh, a lot of a lot of good friends um, are, are there, and we'll be having an open house as soon as we're uh, able to do so legally and safely. But things are moving in the right direction. Uh, the Mackinac Center's board which typically meets in uh, May. We are right now figuring out how can we have our first uh, board meeting in person uh, for a year. And so we're uh, looking, we've got just about all the questions answered and just about everything figured out 
And I know that that's not a meeting that everyone will be able to attend, but I just want you to know that we want to get back to in-person events just as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, not just for the personal uh, connections and friendships that we want to be able to renew face-to-face, uh, -face, really face-to-face, -face. Uh, but it's uh, the, uh, the events are different and better, although I don't think we'll ever go uh, completely uh, back to, uh, uh, to a world where we don't have any uh, video events like this one. So thanks again for your support, and Mike, back to you. Thanks, Joe, and I look forward to uh, the time when we can do more in-person events. Uh, this obviously is, is a great technology that we have, but uh, it's not a perfect substitute. Um, so for today, for the topic, uh, the effectiveness of COVID-19 lockdowns, uh, for all the things that COVID-19 brought, uh, a great natural experiment is probably not the first thing that comes to your mind, uh, but it might be for an economist. And uh, the fact is that the uh, variety of different government responses that occurred in result or as in response to COVID-19 uh, provided this kind of natural experiment uh, in the world and especially in the United States where uh, you know, we have 50 different states and they all took slightly different uh, approaches to responding to COVID. And this is you know, a dream for economists because this provides a natural experiment that they can test and look at the data and uh, draw some conclusions about whether or not, uh, draw some conclusions about the effectiveness of these kinds of policies and interventions. Uh, so we're really happy today to have two uh, experts, expert economists from Michigan colleges to discuss this uh, topic with us. The first uh, presenter is Dave Hebert. He is an associate professor of economics and director of the Center for Markets, Ethics, and Entrepreneurship at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids. Uh, he's a member of the Mackinac Center's Board of Scholars and did his undergraduate work at Hillsdale and got a PhD from uh, George Mason University uh, in economics. The second presenter will be Michael McCovey. He is an assistant professor of economics at Northwood University here in Midland. Uh, he, his research interests include applied econometrics, urban economics, public economics, and constitutional political economy. Uh, he got his PhD from Texas Tech University. Uh, before I turn it over to Dave uh, to get started, though, I want uh, for the audience uh, just to let you know how this uh, event will proceed. Uh, Dave and Michael will both present, and then uh, we'll have time for question and answer. Um, and we want to get questions from you. So if you have a question throughout their presentations, uh, there is a Q&A box that you should see on your screen. And you can uh, pop your question right in there, just fill in it, uh, just type it in, and I'll be able to see those questions. And then at the end of the presentation, um, I will ask as many of those questions as I can uh, of uh, Professor Hebert and Professor McCovey. So uh, with that, let's, uh, let's get started. And uh, Professor Hebert, you're up. All right. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, and thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with everyone today. Uh, it's such a great, uh, important topic, excuse me, such an important topic. And I'm so happy that so many people are, are willing to spend their lunch hour uh, with us today. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to present sort of a, a theoretical paper. So I don't have the, uh, the fancy empirics that uh, my co-panelist here might have. Uh, but what I want to do is is make an argument for how we could think about uh, how to design a lockdown policy in sort of a most efficient way. And so what we start with is this idea that COVID and any type of pandemic is going to impose what we might call external costs on uh, the rest of the community. So if I go outside uh, and I potentially am infected, you know, I'm potentially spreading this virus to other people. And so what I have here is a, a simple graph uh, that just shows that as more and more people stay home, uh, this, these external costs are, are lower. So the idea here is that if everyone just stayed in their home 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there would be no risk of being outside because there'd be no one out there to worry about. But on the other side, we have sort of these what we call internal costs. And what these are, are costs associated with being in isolation. So we can think of these costs as perhaps the additional cost of is trying to live 
in a society as advanced as ours. So going to the grocery store, for example, becomes a much more arduous task the more people are staying home. Being out in public is dangerous, sure, but also being home by yourself is equally dangerous and something that is perhaps not taken into account. And the more people that are uh, staying home in isolation, the higher these costs are going to be. And so what we want in, a, in an ideal world is we would like to have a policy response that takes both these external costs and these internal costs into account. And so what we would do is we would just add these costs together and give us sort of a total cost curve. And so here the idea would be to minimize the sum of these costs. You wanna minimize costs, maximize benefits, it's standard economics 101. Now in this picture, uh, the minimization happens somewhere around 40%. Uh, I don't pretend to know what a 40% lockdown would actually look like. What I wanna do is establish this as sort of a baseline number. Now, when we look at the real world, the external costs are actually going to be significantly lower than we might think as people respond to the dangers of being outside in their own private ways. So perhaps we wear masks on our own, even without a government mandate. Perhaps we practice social distancing, again, on our own, without having sort of a mandate or a policy response that's necessary to enforce. For example, whenever I go walk my dog and I happen to meet someone, you know, coming the opposite way on the sidewalk, the two of us will part and actually walk on opposite sides of the sidewalk, thereby increasing social distance. We've also seen uh, a massive increase in the number of hand sanitizing stations around the state. So it's now very easy for us to keep our hands clean, to keep our faces covered, and to keep our distance between each other. And I think we're all pretty cognizant of the dangers of being around each other in, in today's world, especially with the pandemic still going on. And so as we take those precautions on our own, the external cost curve will actually shift down meaning that the cost of going outside is lower the more precautions you take. And this is standard, this is coming from uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, this comes from the CDC, this is what everyone is kind of saying is the more we can do uh, to keep ourselves and others safe, the lower the cost of being outside actually becomes. But on the other side, oh, and so what this does, I should note, is if you look at it as the uh, external cost falls, the optimal size of the optimal strength of the lockdown policy actually becomes lower. It becomes more permissive for us to go outside, more permissive for us to be among people, provided that we're taking the necessary precautions. On the other side, we wanna look at what the internal costs have actually been throughout this pandemic. And what we posit and what we've found strong evidence of is that these internal costs have been much higher than we ever anticipated beforehand. So reduced social interactions have been shown throughout the last 50 years of psychological research that they lead to increased feelings of loneliness and anxiety. Being prevented from working because of a government lockdown leads to increased anxiety and stress related to finances. Being confined at home has led to a massive increase in intra-household conflict and sometimes even abuse. And so these mental health concerns that we're trying to raise are very real and they're very real costs that have been grossly under acknowledged. And what's primarily uh, troubling about this is that almost all of these concerns, if we look at the data that we, we have available right now, almost all of these concerns are primarily felt by women in the United States. So the reduced social interactions and the feelings of loneliness and anxiety, that's disproportionately affecting women. Being prevented from working, that's disproportionately affecting women. And being confined at home and becoming uh, subject to these intra-household conflicts and abuse is unfortunately primarily affecting women. So the progress that we have made and that we should rightly be celebrating over the last 50 years is slowly being eroded and due to increased government strict, uh, strictness of these lockdowns. And we do see uh, higher rates of all of these things, the stronger the lockdowns are. And so what this means 
is that the effect on the total cost, if we look at the minimization again, what we should expect to find is that the actual optimal lockdown is less severe than we might have anticipated in the beginning. Now, this is not to say that you know government is, is the problem and how dare they not know these things to begin with. Frederick Bastiat reminds us in 1850 that there are seen and unseen effects. So there's no blame here being placed on anyone for enacting too strong of a lockdown at the get-go. In fact, that may have even been the safest thing. However, we need to be cognizant of changes in these cost curves such that we can actually help people and help people in an efficient way. And so what we are positing here is that governments around the country have systematically enacted lockdowns that are too strong, too far reaching, and too uh, overbearing. Instead, what we would like to see is a situation where rather than prevent people from going outside, we instead issue guidance and guidelines that people can follow. If you can meet some standards, and we might have different standards for different industries, if you can meet those standards, then we would suggest that you allow businesses, entrepreneurs, and people to figure out solutions to the problems that they face. Odds are very good that they're going to find a solution that works either just as well, if not better, than any government design solution, and it will be able to address these mental health concerns that we care so deeply about. As we know, necessity can be the mother of invention. But it cannot possibly be the mother of invention if we squelch and prevent people from trying to feel and trying to understand and mitigate the costs that they're feeling. Uh, with that, I thank you so much for your time today, and I look forward to uh, talking with you during the Q&A. Great. Thanks, David. And uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Professor McCovey now. Thank you. Let me uh, make sure you can hear me and see my PowerPoint. Okay, so I am going to be testing what is the actual efficacy of these COVID lockdowns using what is called a quasi-experimental analysis. So I'm going to be testing how effective were the lockdowns at actually achieving the goals they were meant to achieve. Um, you know, this is a research in progress that I'm working with Phil Magnus at the American Institute for Economic Research at uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts. So my goal is to estimate the number of COVID-related outcomes, such as COVID cases and deaths, that were reduced by the lockdown. Some of the, uh, the interesting things I do is, in addition to just looking at COVID cases, I look at deaths from all causes whatsoever, because I'm afraid we may not be necessarily measuring COVID cases and COVID deaths accurately, but measuring total deaths from all causes whatsoever is a lot easier to measure. And I'm also going to be using quasi-experimental methods, which I will explain what those are, rather than uh, more conventional regression analysis. And I think there's reasons to believe that the quasi-experimental method will yield uh, more accurate results. So the question we should ask is, is whether lockdowns work or not. So the interesting thing is that only a few years ago, there was high skepticism of whether a lockdown would ever be effective. So this is an article from 2006 talking about uh, influenza, saying there are no historical observations or scientific studies that support the confinement by quarantine of groups of possibly infected people for extended periods in order to slow the spread of influenza. And they said this mitigation measure should be eliminated from serious consideration. Michael, let me, uh, sorry, yeah. let me interrupt you. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, we can't see, see your screen uh, if you're trying to show uh, oh. those PowerPoint slides. Oh, did I, okay. Uh, right, I got caught up, my fault. I. <laughs> There you go. Sorry yeah. about that. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, okay. So most of what I was showing uh, was just screen saying what I already said. Uh, but here, so this is here's the quote from the article uh, from 2006. 
Here, uh, this is a, uh, a Johns Hopkins University and World Health Organization report from 2019. It said quarantine measures will be less effective for pathogens that are highly transmissible, have short incubation periods, and spread through true airborne mechanisms as opposed to droplets. As with travel restrictions, quarantine appears to delay the introduction of highly transmissible diseases, but not prevent their spread entirely. And it says quarantine measures appear more effective with pathogens with longer incubation periods, such as measles. So in general, there's a lot of, there was a lot of skepticism in previous years about whether a quarantine or lockdown would ever be effective for something like the flu. And interestingly, uh, the World Health Organization said, implementation of some non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as travel restrictions and quarantine, might be pursued for social or political purposes by political leaders, rather than pursued because of public health evidence. That's some interesting um, foreboding there. In January 2020, uh, Dr. Fauci said that historically when you shut things down, it doesn't have a major effect. So this all isn't to say that lockdowns necessarily don't work, but it's at least we should be very skeptical of whether they work because just prior to COVID, it seems that the consensus in the literature was that there was no evidence that quarantines and lockdowns work against the flu. What I'm also concerned about is measurement error. So I'm afraid whether COVID cases and deaths are mismeasured, possibly early in the pandemic, before we knew exactly what COVID was, uh, so maybe not every case of COVID was correctly diagnosed. Same with death. There's also questions like when someone with a pre-existing condition dies with COVID. Well, did they die of COVID or did they die of the pre-existing condition? Like, what if they were going to die in a month anyway, so COVID caused them to die a month sooner? What, what do we count that as? So some of it, uh, there may just be mismeasurement due to novelty and uncertainty. Uh, we may also have lockdowns increase deaths due to things like missed doctor's appointments, uh, let's say cancer screenings, a suicide. So maybe lockdowns reduce some deaths, but cause additional deaths of other kinds. But furthermore, we may actually have much more um, insidious kinds of mismeasurements. So, for example, there's a uh, news came out that uh, Cuomo was and his aides were rewriting nursing home reports to hide death tolls. Now, that does not affect the, the COVID death toll per se. That's actually the reports of nursing home specific deaths. But it still illustrates the problem that maybe some uh, cases or deaths will be misreported for political reasons. Uh, there were also uh, the fact that hospitals were paid more uh, by Medicare if they listed a death as COVID rather than um, another cause of death. So that's, of course, going to uh, increase the incentive for a hospital to report a case of death as COVID. And again, even if hospitals aren't like deliberately lying, you know, what if you have a person who had COVID and then died of heart disease? Well, maybe, what do you call that? You know, maybe, do you call that a heart disease death or a COVID death? Um, so that all just me makes me think we should be skeptical of the measures of COVID cases and deaths. So in my tests, I also use deaths from all causes whatsoever, right? If, if lockdowns reduce COVID deaths, they should also be reducing deaths in general. And deaths in general are much easier to measure. And the final concern, or one of the next concerns is we ha have to remember that all models are hypotheses to be tested. So things like the Imperial College model don't prove anything. Those were hypothetical illustrations of what could be true. You set up a model that assumes certain relationships among certain variables. Well, the model is of course gonna produce that outcome because it, that was what the model was designed and to produce. So, a model should be viewed as a hypothetical illustration of what we think might be true. What we then have to go out is actually empirically test the model to see were the model's predictions actually borne out, 
right? Like if you, let's say, design some computer software to test um, an aircraft in a wind tunnel and you say, okay, we think that this is how, you know, to model air. Well, the model of software is going to produce some prediction of how aerodynamic this plane is. Hopefully when you actually build the physical plane, your model was correct, right? But if you go out and find out the real plane behaves differently than the model, it means your model was wrong. So models, of course, are valuable, but we shouldn't take them as proof. You'll sometimes see people say things like, the Imperial College model produced, uh, predicted a certain number of deaths, but we've only had a different number of deaths. Therefore, the lockdowns prevented all those deaths. Well, that's assuming the model was correct. Who says the model correctly predicted how many deaths there were going to be? So this is just, you know, post hoc ergo propter hoc. A, a certain thing happened. Therefore, the thing that happened before it caused it. Um, well, that's not necessarily true. Um, to illustrate, there's a great uh, scene in Simpsons where they had a, a bear. So the town of Springfield sets up a bear patrol. Homer looks around and says, I don't see any bears. The bear patrol must be working. And Lisa says, that's specious reasoning. By your logic, I could say this rock prevents tigers because I don't see any tigers around, so the rock must be working. And Homer says, Lisa, I want to buy your rock. Right, so we can't assume the, the model said that without lockdowns we'd have deaths. We haven't had that many deaths, therefore the lockdown must be working. Well, that's like Homer's, uh, that's like Lisa's rock that keeps tigers away. Michael, sorry to interrupt one more yes. time, but uh, your your slides aren't advancing. We can just we're kind of locked in on the third oh. slide, so I don't know if there's a different uh, way you can make those advance so we can see them. Or okay. if you want to just continue without. Uh... Let me. What, what if I egg? Okay, let me try exiting um, the present presenter view. Can you see the Simpsons scene right now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I just can't be in slideshow view. <laughs> um. Well. Okay. Well, sorry about that. Uh, so. Yeah, we can see that. That looks good. Okay. Okay. So note that things like the Imperial College model are, um, these are agent-based models. Actually, interestingly, those kinds of models originally came from economics. And it's just these models, they make certain assumptions about the values of certain parameters and variables. Uh, they assume certain kinds of causation between one variable and the other variable. You know, so you're, you're setting up, you basically, this, the way these agent-based models work is you assume lots of representative people, and then you just model what if these people move around and interact with each other, what's the result of these people kind of bouncing around against each other? Well, that assumes that you've correctly assumed the values of certain variables and parameters, like what happens when two people bump up against each other? Well, that's an assumption we have to, build into the model. So again, it's not to say the, the models are not valuable and important, uh, but we have to take them as hypotheses, not as yet proven. Typically, uh, to test the effect of something like lockdown, you would use regression analysis. What regression analysis is, it fits a line of best fit through a scatter plot of points. And the marginal effect or the treatment effect is the slope of the line. So if you plot a scatter plot of y against x, the line of best fit is the slope, right, of how much of a change in x causes how much of a change in y. If you have multiple dimensions, it just becomes more dimensions. So like if you have, right, two dimensions, y and x, it's a line of best fit. If you have three dimensions, x, y, and z, it actually is a plane of best fit, right? So you're fitting a two-dimensional best fit through a three-dimensional space. If you have 20 variables, you're fitting a 19-dimensional hyperplane through a 20-dimensional scatter plot of points. You can't really visualize that, but it's, it's, it's the essence of it is the same as a two-dimensional scatter plot. The issue here is that the estimate will depend on the model specification, meaning, for example, if you estimate y equals beta x, where beta is the unknown slope, and you just want to know what's the slope of that line, you'll get a different result than y equals beta x squared, or 
log y equals beta log x. So depending on how you transform different variables, the slope will become different. So in order to evaluate the effect of a lockdown with regression analysis, we would already have to know in advance what is the correct functional form, how does one case of COVID cause another case of COVID, and how does a lockdown intervene to prevent one case of COVID from causing another? We would have to know the, the functional relationship prior to our estimation, which is a problem because the whole question is, do we know the functional relationship or not? So instead, I use what's called a quasi-experimental method, which attempts to replicate the most desirable aspect of an experiment with randomly assigned treatment. If you have a randomly assigned treatment experiment, you don't need control variables and you don't need to worry about model specification. You just take the average outcome for the treated, the average outcome of the control units, and subtract one from the other because the whole nature of random assignment of treatment means that we don't have to worry about all these other confounding problems. So I use what's called propensity score matching, which attempts to, est it takes, the treatment is a one or a zero, you estimate using uh, the set of available variables, you estimate whether a unit was likely to be treated or not, and then you compare two different units, so here's like U.S. states, that had equal likelihoods to be treated, but one was treated and the other wasn't. So if we can estimate the likelihood that one state would have imposed a lockdown, and then we take two states, one that had a lockdown and the other that didn't, but they both have the same estimated probability of imposing a lockdown, we can now compare these two states to each other and simply subtract the outcome of one from the outcome of the other and estimate uh, the effect of the lockdown with much less need to specify a functional form of how does COVID cause COVID and how do lockdowns intervene. That's the method that I will be using. Uh, won't dwell super long, I have the data I get are Various kinds of uh, COVID cases, COVID deaths, deaths from all causes whatsoever, and there is a state-level measure of lockdown stringency, uh, which I use. So I won't go over that, but if anyone wants to see those data for themselves, I'm sure this PowerPoint can be provided in some way. Um, yeah. I also estimate excess deaths which is the mean number of deaths at a certain time of year in previous years, right? So, I mean, the current number of deaths minus the average number of deaths at the same time of year in previous years gives us excess deaths. So my outcomes are COVID cases, COVID deaths, excess deaths, and total deaths. And it, presumably lockdowns should reduce all of those. Uh, the lockdown stringency has many different types of lockdowns, school closings, workplace closings, public events. Um, I basically just group all those together and average them. So we're just getting an average measure of lockdown in general. I estimate the probability of a lockdown using... Um, the number of COVID cases in the past, so any given state's probability of imposing a lockdown in the present is estimated as a function of whether it had COVID cases in the past, whether it had a lockdown in the past, and mean flu and pneumonia deaths in previous years, and various measures of population density, age distribution, uh, and hospital availability. So any given state's probability of a lockdown um, is a measure of all that. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare, I define treatment as a state with a lockdown, half a standard deviation above the average, and lack of lockdown is half a standard deviation below the average. So we're going to be comparing states that had above average lockdown to states with below average lockdown, but they both had the same estimated probability of a lockdown based on their past behavior. So we want to, we're gonna compare states that like randomly for some reason one state imposed a lockdown and the other didn't, and we don't know why, 
but they were both states that were similar to each other in all other respects. So it is meant to be similar to a randomly assigned treatment. If we could have just randomly told some states, you impose a lockdown, but you don't get to impose a lockdown because we rolled the dice and that's how the dice came out. Let's see who has more deaths. We can't do that, but this is the best way we know of, of approximating that. The results I get, uh, what I have here is ATT is the treatment effect, is the difference between the treated and the untreated. We have the mean outcomes of both. Each column, we have total deaths per 100,000, excess deaths per 100,000, COVID deaths per 100,000, and COVID cases per 100,000. Each of those is its own column. The rows, we have the mean outcomes, treated and untreated, meaning lockdown and not lockdown, and the difference. Now, the interesting thing here is that in most of these cases, we do find that the lockdown treated cases have a lower number of deaths or cases, but statistically, they are not significant. The p-values down there are measures of the statistical significance, which the p-value is basically, well, it's really, really technical to explain, uh, but basically it is the probability that we would have observed this effect assuming random chance. So we observe that the lockdown states had fewer deaths than the non-lockdown states. But like in column one, I'm finding there was a 65.7% chance that we would have observed that just due to random chance, even if lockdowns did nothing at all. So what this basically means is that statistically, we cannot distinguish these results from pure random chance, which means there's no statistical effect. Except in the last column, I do find statistically significant reduction in COVID cases due to lockdowns. There, the p-value 0.04 or 0.1 means there would have either been a 4% chance or a 10% chance of random chance producing this result, which is fairly low. This is all measured on a monthly level. So here is some evidence that lockdowns prevented COVID cases, but did nothing to reduce the number of deaths. So that made me wonder, maybe it takes two months for a death to happen. So then I ran it again using um, what happens, does a lockdown prevent deaths two months in the future rather than only one month in the future? What I get here is basically the results jump all over the place if I just change the variables slightly. Um, it actually, in some case, using some variables, I can't even get the matching to work, which basically means in some cases, states are so idiosyncratic and different from each other that it's impossible to even find matches for each other, which simply means the world is so complicated that we can't even draw any statistical conclusions at all. That's sometimes what happens. Sometimes the best conclusion we can get is the world just doesn't have any natural experiments. We can't draw any conclusions. If I tweak the variables a little bit, I can get it to run. But if you look at these p-values, they jump all over the place. They go from 0 0.08 or 0 0.09, which means random chance is unlikely to be a source of the result, which means lockdowns are probably the cause of the result. But then the p-value becomes 73% or 74%, which means random chance had a 74% chance of producing the results I got, which means we can't tell. So the results are somewhat messy, but the ultimate conclusion I get is that most of the results are either statistically insignificant, we cannot distinguish these results from just random statistical noise, or very small changes in variable lists produce extremely large changes in the estimate, which is a standard thing for um, empirical analysis to do is what's called robustness tests where we say, look, we can never be completely sure we're including the right variables or the right model, so what if we just kind of make very small random changes to our variable list? Just maybe take one variable out and add a different one in. Hopefully we get the same result, and if we're not even sure which variables ought to be included in the first place, we should be able to get the same result even if we just kind of randomly tweak things. But when I randomly do these little tweaks, the results just jump all over the place, which means we can't trust anything. And the bottom line is I don't find any evidence that these lockdowns were reducing 
uh, COVID cases or deaths, especially not deaths. I, at no point did I find any, I think, really good evidence of a reduction in the number of deaths due to COVID lockdowns. Okay, thank you, Michael and, and Dave. Uh, we are going to uh, give you guys some Q&A here, and uh, we've got some questions that have been submitted in the in the box, but if you have additional ones, uh, please feel free to uh, put them there, and I'll, I'll look them over. Uh, we had a couple of questions about statistics and the data that you're using, and I think uh, specifically for Michael, but also Dave, uh, I'd like to hear your, uh, your take on this as well. How do you, you know, we've, we've had a lot of different, um, there are a lot of different data sources and different methodologies to use that data uh, related to COVID. Uh, do you have some general recommendations on how, you know, how we can assess the, um, uh, the importance of different types of data and the meaning behind different types of data uh, as we're looking at uh, uh, what's happening with COVID? I would say, I th as far as I can tell, most of the data out there have a pretty straightforward meaning, right? right? Like COVID cases, COVID deaths, I think those mean what they're supposed to mean. Um, I think, you know, like I said, my skepticism there is like, did we always know what was COVID and what wasn't? You know, so I'm a little bit skeptical of the COVID, you know, cases and deaths. But I think those measures still mean something. I wouldn't say like those measures are meaningless. I just thought it would be good to use deaths from all causes whatsoever because there's less uncertainty there and hopefully we get the same result both ways. I think the bigger place to be skeptical is any empirical analysis of the effectiveness. You wanna be paying close attention to, did they assume a certain functional form or what was the counterfactual? Like who was being compared to what? Like in any statistical analysis, whether it's explicit or implicit, there's always some sort of counterfactual, like if you draw the scatter plot of points, for example, all of these points are being compared to each other. So you just want to ask, how did they structure the empirical modeling to design who's being compared to what? Does this, which I mean, I guess to really do that, you have to know even more about statistics. But that's the that's the, the whole point of this quasi-experimental method, though, is to me, make it so that those issues become much less important than they would be in a traditional uh, regression analysis. And I guess what I would say is um, I would just use the sniff test, which is kind of a very uh, informal and imprecise way to do things. But if you see a statistic and it looks patently absurd to you, there's a pretty good chance that it's meaning something different from what you actually might think or something weird is going on. So for example, it's to me, it's very strange that Michigan, for example, is leading the nation in daily COVID cases, daily new COVID cases. That seems a bit odd. Uh, it could be true, but I would like to look a little bit more into those numbers and figure out what other states are doing. Perhaps we have another situation like uh, uh, Governor or Mayor Cuomo uh, misreporting COVID deaths in uh, elderly uh, care homes or something to that effect. So I always just kind of use just a a really easy look at the data, look at the number that's coming out. If it makes sense, okay, it's probably true. If it doesn't make any sense to you, dive a little bit deeper there. And Dave, let me uh, just keep it with you here. Uh, we had one question about uh, whether or not you think um, part of the uh, potential ineffectiveness of the government's response has anything to do with uh, politicians, policymakers, lack of technical expertise. Um, are they not well suited to handle these kinds of and make decisions about these kinds of public health crises? Yeah, so this is uh, this is a great question. And I, I thank the, uh, the person, unfortunately, I don't have it on my screen right now, but thank you so much for asking this. You know, this is one of those situations where we we're confronted very starkly and very clearly with the incentives that politicians face. Oftentimes, politicians have a very, very strong incentive to do something, and it could be anything. And so they see a plan and they say, yes, we're gonna do it, and we're gonna lead the nation, damn it, in the strongest response we possibly can because we wanna be the best. The unfortunate reality is that oftentimes they, pres they presume a lot more knowledge and a lot more expertise than they might actually have. 
And also they presume that they have an accurate picture of the costs. So this is where uh, what we highlight in our research are these, these internal costs, the mental health costs that really matter. These are important costs. You know, these aren't just trivial, you know, oh, I feel sad because I have to sit on my couch all day. This is a real concern that we need to take into account and one that is systematically likely to not be taken fully into account ahead of time. Now, it's true that, you know, even I didn't take these costs into account fully. No one could have known ex ante or before the fact that these costs were going to be so large and so real. However, we do have the ability to shift gears and change what it is that we're doing. And I think especially in Michigan with our endless lockdowns and our, you know, just another two more weeks, I think we're on round 30 of two more weeks and then we'll be good. Uh, we do have the ability to change course. And the unfortunate thing is that when you are the captain of the ship, if you admit that you need to change course, well, you're admitting that you were wrong. And that's a very hard thing for especially elected officials to do because they don't want to appear weak. And this is the unfortunate reality that we find ourselves in. And it's had disastrous effects around the country, not just in terms of COVID cases, but in terms of the mental health aspects as well. Yeah, and one of the things that has uh, been most puzzling for me is uh, the willingness of politicians everywhere, uh, virtually across the globe, to set aside all of that technical expertise and the, and the plan, the pandemic plans that were prepared by public health officials and other experts, and try a brand new uh, experiment with lockdowns and with brand new kinds of um, rules and regulations related to controlling a pandemic. Michael, you uh, mentioned this uh, with some of the uh, slides that you presented at the beginning that uh, lockdowns were, were not the thing that were recommended by public experts before COVID. So I wondered if uh, either one of you could talk a little bit about why you think that occurred? Why did uh, politicians largely just throw those plans out the window and, and start uh, these and try out these different kinds of new policies? My impression, now I'll say this is uh, where my co-author Phil Magnus is really, um, this is his specialization right here. I'm the, I'm mostly doing the empirics and he's done a lot of the background uh, research and like the political dynamics. So I'm speaking a little bit outside my comfort zone. I, my impression is that a lot of it was that Imperial College model, I think, got so much attention and so you know, overawed everyone with its apocalyptic predictions. My impression is that, you know, I think a lot of whatever happened with lockdowns after that, you know, people were citing that Imperial College and say, see, look, if we don't do lockdowns, this many people will die. Uh, which, you know, isn't meant as a criticism of that model. It's just meant as I think. I think that's my impression is that's a lot of what happened. So I would say, uh, so, you know, we're all, uh, unlike my students, we're all old enough to remember the H1N1 uh, potential pandemic in 2009 and how that went away, you know, very quickly. Well, the reason that went away very quickly is because the only people who were contagious were actually exhibiting symptoms and they were only contagious while they were exhibiting symptoms. And so if someone started to show symptoms, we could very easily isolate them from the rest of the population and in doing so protect everyone. COVID-19 is very different as we all know. Many people are asymptomatic. Testing was thrown out the window essentially by the FDA at the very outset of this. And people can be symptomatic, or I'm sorry, asymptomatic for two weeks while they're contagious and potentially spreading this around. And so the solution of, of purely isolating the people who are the actual spreaders is impractical if we are not going to have widespread, cheaply available testing. And so in that world, I can understand the tendency and the desire to have sort of a broad lockdown for the general population it makes a little bit of intuitive sense. Otherwise, no one would have done it. You know, no one I think is enjoying uh, being locked down. No one's enjoying being the person that has to, or quote unquote, has to lock other people down. And so I think it's, it's a somewhat legitimate fear 
that there may be no other way for a policy response to actually do this. And so um, I would say that, that the basis of lockdowns being an idea that might sound good, that has at least some amount of merit. Uh, whether or not it's correct, that's a much bigger issue. I tend to side on the, uh, I come down on the side that it is not. And so given people, giving people the opportunity to succeed, I think is an important thing. This is where the American founding comes in. You know, we're supposed to be 50 independent states. And we're supposed to have a laboratory of experiments going all the time. But when you have one central authority in Washington, D.C., basically telling everyone that you must use this, this fix called lockdowns, you've destroyed the experiment of the entire country and you've destroyed our ability to come up with novel solutions to novel problems. Okay, that's us um, And I guess I, well, I was gonna say, I, I see someone in the chat has said uh, that it's been shown that COVID has nearly a zero risk of asymptomatic transmission. Uh, nearly zero is very different from zero. And so uh, I'm not quite ready to bet the farm that the answer is is literally zero. I agree, it's probably much lower than, than we might think. And that just goes to show that the external costs that I pointed out before are actually much lower than the government may have anticipated at the start. Uh, so thank you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use your citation that you shared uh, in, in your comment here. Um, and uh, I thank you so much for that, that citation. Thanks so much. Yeah, and I think, uh, Dave, that goes to a, a point that you made earlier, which is uh, maybe early on in the pandemic, that was the uh, assumption that needed to be made, that um, uh, asymptomatic people could just as easily spread COVID as uh, symptomatic people. But uh, if we've learned over time that that uh, is less the case or that it's very rare, then we can change. Uh, we can we can adopt different policies. And, of course, um I think part of your uh, point is sort of uh, erring on the side of uh, uh, reducing those costs as much as possible, which would be less dramatic types of policy responses. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think the, in, the initial response being overly strong, that's that makes total sense to me. I have no problem with, you know, when this first started, everyone, you know, basically being terrified and, and locking their doors and shunning everyone. That makes sense. But as we learn, we should be able to change both our policies and our behavioral responses in light of that new information. And that is what I think is missing. Uh, Michael, I want to go back to you. Uh, so some of your results uh, are counterintuitive in, in some ways because, um, you know, uh, I, I saw one of the results that it looked like lockdowns had a, a non or a statistically significant impact on reducing case loads or the number of cases in a state. Uh, well, uh, I, I think it is very intuitive to think fewer cases eventually means fewer deaths. So uh, how can you also then find that they had no impact on death? How do you how do you talk about that or uh, respond to someone who sort of approaches it from that perspective of lockdowns mean fewer cases and therefore Fewer cases means fewer deaths. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. I think it could mean, it might mean maybe cases were being mismeasured. So maybe that's not the actual number of cases, which I think is one reason I wanted to use deaths in the first place, precisely because deaths are the thing we're actually trying to reduce. And we have a lot, you know, much better way of measuring deaths than cases. Especially, you know, given how, um, you know, testing changed over time and how much of a lack of testing there's been in the first place, you know, maybe we should be most skeptical. I'd say probably don't you know, be most skeptical of the measures of cases, be less skeptical than that of COVID deaths, and then be least skeptical of all of measures of, of deaths in general. So that might just be a, right there a testimony to the, you know, issue of measurement error. Or, I mean, maybe, um, maybe we did a good enough job of saving lives of anyone, of saving as many lives of people with COVID as we could have. So maybe reducing the number of COVID cases doesn't reduce the number of deaths very much if we're saving as many lives as we're possibly able to save. So maybe the people who are going to, you know, die, died regardless of what we could do. And maybe the people who lived 
you know, live because hospitals were able to save them and maybe the lockdowns just didn't affect that. I'm not exactly sure, but um, that's what I, what I would suspect. Thanks. And uh, we have time just for uh, just for one more question. Um, I'm wondering what uh, how you two approach or respond to uh, the studies that we've all probably seen uh, in the media um, that suggest just the opposite of, of what the two of you are suggesting here, which is that uh, there's not a lot of evidence uh, to support the idea that lockdowns work. I know that the CDC put out a study not long ago that uh, suggested that uh, uh, banning indoor dining at restaurants uh, had a significant effect. Uh, I know that the University of Michigan put out a study about Michigan's uh, pause period over the winter, which also found that uh, estimated that 2,000 lives were saved as a result of that. Uh, what, what do you find, how do you respond and, and what do you typically find uh, when you look at those kinds of studies that uh, report the opposite kind of finding that you've uh, stated here? Um, so I'd have to look at some of those uh, studies, you know, each one specifically and remind myself of each one exactly what their methodology was. Um, what I would say in general is that I think uh, the quasi-experimental method like the one I used is much more trustworthy than a lot of other methods. Just with, with, with any kind of regression analysis, there become big problems with um, what is the counterfactual, what is being compared to. Like, and sometimes you'll even see people uh, do very poor analysis of just like, let's say, they'll take a certain state and compare the number of deaths in one month to itself the previous month. And it's like, well, other things might have changed. You can't just do a before and after. Um, like there, for example, there's a quasi-experimental method you could use called difference in difference, where you take the difference between a place and itself over time, the difference between its counterfactual over time. So like it might be, let's say, Michigan before and Michigan after, and let's say, Whatever, some other state, Indiana, whatever. Indiana, before and after, you have two differences. Now you subtract one difference from the other difference, and you get the difference in the difference, which is supposed to control for both locational differences and time differences. So I'd have to look at these other studies uh, and remind myself exactly what they did. But what I would say in general is I think um, – the kind of method that I used, I think, is much less likely uh, to suffer from hidden problems that some other empirical techniques might have. So if there is any conflict, I would personally prefer to trust the quasi-experimental method rather than the regression methods. And if you can't get the same result by multiple methods, that right itself should already tell you there's a problem. If, if two, if two studies that are both equally well constructed are getting different results, which I think my study is well constructed, um, others may disagree and, you know, it awaits, uh, you know, this is still research in progress. But if you can't get the same result by multiple methods, there's already a question there. So I would say uh, we live in a, a hyper partisan world where, you know, you're either going to find someone who is a, an, a firm believer in the efficacy of lockdowns or they are completely against it. Uh, very few are going to be agnostic on this one. You also live in a world where a lot of funding for research, for scholarship, for any type of scientific endeavor uh, comes from either state or federal governments. And so if you want to secure funding from a government agency, and that government is pro-lockdown, you're going to be very uh, likely to find evidence that what they're doing is correct. We need to remember that politics is not a game of truth-seeking. It's a game of finding evidence for the claim that you've already made. And so if you have that system set up where the person in charge of the purse is a firm believer in lockdowns, such as in the state of Michigan, you might find that the research that is most heavily funded, most heavily supported, and most heavily promoted is the research that supports what the governor has done here. And so I would question those studies not only on the methodological grounds that uh, my co-presenter here has, has highlighted, but I would also look at the sources of funding and the incentives that these people faced when doing their research.
That's a way to bring it, bring it all home there, Dave, with having an economist uh, emphasize the importance of incentives. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, we are at the end of time uh, for today. I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, there, this, the recording of this event will be available uh, on the Mackinac Center's website uh, shortly after this is over. Uh, and uh, if you also want to learn more about the Mackinac Center and the work that we do, we invite you to visit our website at mackinac.org. Uh, the Mackinac Center is a private, uh, independent nonprofit, and if you would like to contribute to our work, uh, we would uh, love to talk with you more about that as well. So uh, look for new events on our website as well. We'll have uh, upcoming virtual events uh, through, uh, in the next few months, and uh, we hope to see you at one of those uh, real soon. Uh, take care. Have a great rest of your day.